Nathan and his wife, Samantha, were celebrating their 30th wedding anniversary. They went on a cruise. He'd had a very successful military career. He was out of the military. He was just going to chill, enjoy this cruise, enjoy his wife enjoying this cruise. He bought her some special seminars that she really wanted to go to. They were extra cost, and she was delighted about that. There was a gardening seminar that she'd gone to on the cruise ship, and she was out for a couple hours in that. He'd gone to the bar, got himself a pina colada, visited with some of the guys at the bar, and just decided to go out and lean on the rail and look at the ocean. It was beautiful. It was a beautiful day as far as he could see, as far as he could look around. All he saw was ocean and the sky. No land in sight. Now, he had very well-trained military eyes, so he perused the horizon just to see if maybe there's another ship somewhere. Maybe there's a boat. Maybe something else. Maybe there'll be an airplane because the sky was empty. And he was looking around. And so far in the distance, he saw two small dots. And he focused on those. He thought, probably fishing boats. They were about three hours off the coast of anywhere. Yeah, fishing boats could be out here. He thought, maybe that's fishing boats. And he watched, and they seemed to be coming toward the ship. And even though the ship was going this way, they kept aiming at the ship. As they got a little bit closer, he saw flashes. He saw men on the deck. He saw flashes of light. And from his military days, he realized those were weapons around their necks. Those were probably AK-47s flashing. And he automatically yelled out pretty loud, all hands on deck. Well, all the people on the crew stopped and looked at him. Crew members didn't know what was doing. He said, again, all hands on deck. Well, the crew kind of came to him. It's like, sir, are you all right? And he says, listen, I'm military. Look at those two boats. They're coming this way. Those flashes you're seeing, those are their weapons around their necks. Those are their rifles. We're about to be robbed by pirates. You need to prepare. Take me to your captain. I can help if he'll let me. So two more security guards now. He's got four security guards. He's running down the hallway, getting to the, the captain, walks in, doesn't waste any time, says, Captain, you're about to be under attack by pirates. I'm military. I can help you if you'll let me. And somehow the captain said, let's do what you think we should do. And the captain, he said, you know, steer away from them, see if they follow us. So there's these two boats that are getting closer and closer. He's steering away. They've gotten up to the bridge. They're watching everything on deck. They've told all the passengers over the loudspeakers, go to your room, lock the door, and don't come out. He's called his wife just before this and said, hey, listen, go to the room, lock the door, don't ask me questions now, but don't open the door unless you hear the sound of my voice. So his wife was gone. He's watching everything. They feel this bump on the side of the boat. Out of nowhere, a third boat had come on the other side of the ship, rammed the ship. They felt it. It didn't slow down an ocean liner that much, but they felt it. And there were five pirates on that boat. They threw uh, grappling hooks onto the cruise ship and started to board. Well, they got most of the people away in time before these guys actually climbed their ropes up and came on board. So the people were locked up. It's kind of quiet. Captain said, what do we do now? He said, kill the engines. We don't want to agitate these guys. Our goal is to be sure that nobody gets hurt. I know you've got insurance. I'll deal with these people. I've got lots of experience if you want me to. And the captain said, what would you suggest? He said, let's watch them. Let's see what they're up to. There are five of them. They're going down a hallway. They're seeing them, all the cameras, and they split. The captain tells two of them to go one direction. They head that direction. He says, okay, let me take about four or five of your security guys with me. On the way, he came up with a plan. So he said, okay, I'm going to go on deck. I'm going to act like I have no idea what's going on. When they are approaching me, and I will give you a very inconspicuous sense, signal, watch me. When you see me signal, drop the big net on top of them. So he's standing out. He's got a drink. In fact, he's act, kind of acting a little bit like he's had too many drinks already. And he's just out there. And these guys come. They've got their AK-47s, swords hanging beside the machetes. That's kind of how the pirates are. They're scary looking guys. They're dirty. They're shiny with sweat. Uh, and they look mean. 
So he's standing there, and these three guys, these two guys are approaching him, and he gives whatever the signal was. The net drops. It knocks them down. The security team jumps out, gets on top of them before they can get their guns or their swords raised, and they've captured those two. He gets back to the bridge. They're still watching the other three. The captain of the pirates was named Jack, and Jack is in control, but Jack is getting a little bit edgy. He's walking through hallways, and he's saying, come out. Open your door and come out, or we're going to come in after you. He's trying to scare people, and nobody's coming out. They've been given instructions. So he fires his AK-47 three or four rounds into the ceiling. His partners do the same thing. You know, you're in close quarters. No telling where those are bullets are going through the, the ceiling into the next floor. But they're firing their weapons, and they realize – He's escalating. He's probably going to find somebody and do something radical. He told the captain, I don't want to take any fatal weapons, lethal weapons. Do you have a stun gun and do you have any handcuffs I could take? He said, Captain, can I borrow your uniform? He borrows the captain's dress uniform. He puts it on. He gets a plan together. He goes where these guys are still up and down the hallway. He knows where they're headed. The crew gets him there first. He's got some security guys right behind him. And when he feels like they're not too far away, he steps around the corner. These three pirates see him. They aim their guns at him. He holds his hands up and said, may I speak to you? I'm the captain. And they walked toward him, and he said, I know you want as much valuable stuff as you can get as quickly as you can, and I know your boat's not that big. If you'll follow me, I will take you to our cargo area where the most valuable cargo is stored. You can have it. My only request is you just don't hurt another human being. And he saw what he was looking for. He saw greed in the eyes of Captain Jack. And Captain Jack said, yeah, we'll go with you. So he leads them. He knows where he's going. He's acting like he knows where he's going. He goes down to the cargo area. He's got keys from the real captain. He takes them in a place. They're looking at all the cargo. He's watching Captain Jack. He's watching to see what he pays attention to. So he takes all three of them to a closet. It's got a door that's locked. He pulls the key out, he unlocks it, he opens the door, flips on the light, and there are a few boxes that had been arranged there that were full of jewelry. And it just like they were there for the taking. So two pirates that are with the captain go in there and they immediately start loading their bags up. They came prepared to get stuff. They're putting in their bags. But Jack, the captain, wants to go out and see what else there is. He saw something that looked like expensive electronics. As he got closer to it, at the right moment, Nathan, the guy with the military background, dressed like the captain, shoves him. There is a covered hole which he falls in. When he yells, the other two guys look out, somebody from the security, shuts the door and locks them in, and they've got them. Now, he's already had them call the Coast Guard. They're waiting for the Coast Guard. The guys in the net are handcuffed and inoperable now. He's got three more trapped down there. He lets the Coast Guard come get them and take them away peacefully. Nobody got hurt. How do you do something like that? You've got to know who you are. You've got to know your skill set. You need to know your God. And you need to have faith. We're going to look at faith today. We're going to talk about how faith is the best thing you can have to get you through impossible situations. When you find yourself and you're outnumbered, you're outgunned, you're underfinanced, you're having trouble, you need faith to get it through you. You'll notice when people are acting in faith, four things usually happen. God reveals more clearly than ever before the person's true identity who's acting in faith. You'll see that God supplies everything the people need, often just in the absolute nick of time. You'll see that God su 
supplies allies in other people that you may not even know to be on your side. And you see that God never loses. He has victories which greatly benefit the people who are acting in faith on his behalf. So we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 11, which is probably the best chapter in the Bible about faith. It defines faith in the beginning. Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is being sure of things hoped for and certain of things not seen. When we go to Hebrews 11, chapter 32, chapter 11, verse 32, it says, And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith. Now, there's going to be a long list of what these guys did in faith. You can do these same kind of things. And through faith, conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. That's a whole lot. Now, the first person in that list was Gideon. Gideon was one of the judges of Israel. The judges came along after Joshua. You remember Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt after about 400 years of bondage and captivity and slavery. He got them out. They walked across the Red Sea on dry land. Then they wandered in the wilderness for a while. In the wilderness, God supernaturally provided for them so well that their shoes didn't even wear out in 40 years. And then Joshua leads them in the promised land. When Joshua died, that's when God started sending the judges somebody that God would raise up, somebody that God would empower supernaturally, somebody that would protect the people and lead the people and guide the people spiritually. Some of those were questionable people like Samson, but they got the job done. And that went on until the monarchy was established when Israel wanted a king and they got Saul and then David. The story of Gideon happens about 3,000 years ago, you're going to see that his story is like our story because you're going to see what God does. God is going to reveal his identity. God is going to deal with the weakness in faith that he has. God is going to send all the supplies, all the people to help him, and God is going to have the victory in the end because God always wins. Chapter 6 of Judges, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. This is just the cycle that Israel has gone through for hundreds and hundreds of years. It starts where God is blessing them. They are doing so good, they forget where the blessing has come from, and they turn away from God. God sends a prophet to warn them they need to turn back, but they don't listen. God lets an oppressor come in and make their lives miserable. They cry out to God after they had enough misery and realize that God's way works. and Their way doesn't work. They turn back to God. God sends a deliverer to deliver them, and they're back to the blessings. I have been through that cycle many times. I've been through that cycle for years at a time. I'm down to the short cycle now because I turn away from God. And he goes, what are you doing? Uh, I've stopped believing you. I've turned away from you. I forgot about you. I'm really messing up. Would you let me just take the shortcut back? He said, fine, come on, come on, come on. I don't have to go through that full cycle anymore. But it happens. They went through this cycle for hundreds of years. You can go through this cycle for decades in your life. You can get it down to years, to months, to weeks, 
and you get so good at it, you may go through a cycle like this just in a day's time, maybe two or three times a day. You forget about God, he'll remind you and you turn back. You start to short cycle and your life gets so much better. So they have turned away from God. Verse three, for whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalites, Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of their land. They come at harvest time. They take all the crops. They would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come like locusts in number because they and their camels could not be counted so that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought, Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. I hope this is good news. Here these people are. They've walked away from God. They've done evil in his sight. They were ungrateful. They were disobedient. They were bad, bad, bad. They cry out to God, and God hears them. And God responds to them. This will happen for you. It doesn't matter how far you get away from God. You always are welcome back to God because he loves you with an everlasting love. He'll come. He'll help. They have asked for that help. Then God tags Gideon to be the judge, to help them, to be the leader. Verse 11, now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Bezerite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. So we start out with Gideon. He's scared. He's living in hiding. He's just trying to stay hidden long enough to beat the wheat, to thresh it, to have some food to eat. He's having a tough, tough time. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. That term, mighty man of valor, is just huge. It's hard to translate from the Hebrew. I looked at several examples. It means you've got everything you need. You're mighty. You're powerful. You're wealthy. You're well-supplied. You're well-trained. It means you're totally, completely equipped for the job. It means you are all you need to be to get this job done. The Lord appears, says, I'm with you, O oh, mighty man of valor. Well, that's his identity. That's God's true identity. He doesn't recognize it. He doesn't agree with it. He doesn't have much faith. So he starts out with very little faith. If you just have very little faith today, welcome to Gideon's world. He starts little, but he ends big because God progressively builds his faith. Gideon is a picture of progressive faith. He starts weak. So the first thing when the angel of the Lord appears to him says, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. That could be a pretty big compliment. But he argues. And Gideon said to him, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us saying, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. Well, they were a little bit mistaken. God didn't forsake them. They left God. That's usually what happens. I've really never known God to bail out on anybody. They leave him. That's what happened in the very beginning. Adam and Eve, they hid from God. God didn't hide from them. They might have felt like God was hiding. They made up stories in their head, but God was always there for them. He even came looking for them. So Gideon's faith is pretty lame so far, and he's got a lot of questions. Verse 14, and the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you. And he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. 
Now, how many times has God asked you to do something and you thought, oh, I can't do that. I'm not equipped for that. I can't handle that. I look back over my life and try to think about times when I've taken big steps of faith. I think one of the biggest steps of faith I ever took in my life, and it was because I, it's not because I was so holy and godly. I was desperate. I needed a job. And Wilshire Baptist Church called me as their youth minister over at Mockingbird and Abrams, big church, top 2% of the biggest Baptist churches in the country. Great church because somebody recommended me that I had known me all of my life. They gave me the job. I didn't have seminary. I didn't have experience. I was 23 years old. I was leading people 22 years old and younger. So I was really kind of one of them. And they made me the youth minister there. I didn't know what I was doing, but God helped me. He caused miracles happen. He surrounded me with people who were wise, who were older, who had kids in the youth ministry that would do anything for the youth ministry. He provided a place for us to have a summer camp to pull the kids back together that had been splintered because they'd been without a youth minister for so long. He just provided everything I needed told you a story two or three weeks ago. I'm going to recap it. I'm going to hit the highlights about identity. Jamie Winship is an authority on helping people find their true identity. He does seminars and has workbooks and written books about our true identity. He said when people find their true identity, life gets a whole lot better because they're doing what God created them for. Gideon is resisting his true identity. Sometimes it takes us a while to figure out who we are. So Jamie had three sons. He was teaching everybody in the country and all over the world how to find their true identity. His two oldest sons had it, kind of knew who their identity was. And his youngest son, when he was in sixth grade, listened to his dad, watched his dad in these seminars, read the books, smart kid, knew how to do it. He said, God, would you tell me what you'd like for me to know about my true identity? And God answered him, said, you're a skateboarder for Jesus. So he went to his dad and said, dad, dad, I've got my true identity. I'm a skateboarder for Jesus. His dad was like, responded well, said, great, son. Do you have a skateboard? Nope, don't have a skateboard. Let's get you a skateboard. Bought him a cheap skateboard. Said poor skid was clumsy, didn't have a good sense of balance, was always skinning up his elbows and his knees, but he was serious. He really... He really went after it. He thought, this is my true identity. Two years later, after God's revealed his true identity, mom and dad call the family in and say, hey, the State Department wants us to go to Baghdad in Iraq in the middle of the war. Well, they don't have skateboarding there. It's a war zone. You can only leave your house about two hours a day. So it's, I mean, it is martial law over there. It doesn't look like a good place for a skateboarder. And Caleb is devastated. It's like, Dad, you want to take me somewhere where I cannot be my true identity? What are you thinking? And his wise father said, let's pray about it. Let's both pray about it. And then we'll talk about it some. Well, Caleb prayed for about five days, and God spoke to him and said, trust your father. He went to his father, and he said, Dad, I think God told me. He answered my prayer. I'm supposed to trust you. I don't know why or how, but I'm. That's what God told me to do, so I'll do it. I'll go to Baghdad with you, like he had a choice. But, you know, eighth graders, they're tough kids. He's going to Baghdad. His father says, I've been praying about it too. And son, God would not tell you what your true identity is if he didn't have a plan. And for some strange reason, I think Baghdad is going to be a good place for you. And the kids thinking they hadn't had internet in the last 10 years. They don't know what skateboarding is. And it's been blown up. And they've got martial law. So we really can't do anything. But he went in faith. When he got there, one day he was out for his couple of hours in the afternoon when he could be out of the house. He's skateboarding. He's got long, blonde hair. Kind of stands out in the Middle East just a little bit. Zipping down the street on the skateboard, an army tank, an M1, one of those gigantic, huge tanks, comes zipping around the corner, sees this kid going, screaming down the sidewalk on his skateboard, pulls up alongside him, says, slow down, stop. And so the tank stops, and he stops. And the guy says, kid, who are you? 
he said, well, I'm Caleb Winship and my parents work for the U.S. government. I live about two blocks over there. And the guy said, just a minute, stay there. And he disappears in the tank. He comes up to the tank, top of the tank, and he climbs out the hole, gets down and said, hey, we're U.S. National Guard. I got five buddies inside. We're all from California. We're all skateboarders. And he said, can I ride, can, can I ride your skateboard? We don't have skateboards over here, but we'd love to. Can I take a quick little trip? And the guy was good. So he comes back. He visits with Caleb. He says, listen, come to the park next time. The Central Park is kind of like New York, huge park. It used to be beautiful before the war. And there were all these fountains in it. He said, it's full of these fountains. There's no water in them. They're perfect for skateboarders. You can, you can skate on those bowls. You can have so much fun and bring your friends. We'll be there guarding you. So he goes, goes the second day, and some Iraqi kids show up. They're watching. They want to learn about skateboarding. In the meantime, he's written an article and sent it to Skateboard Magazine. His parents didn't know he did this. They publish his article. He wins the prize for the best article. They ship him a whole bunch of skateboards. So now he's got a ministry. He's got skateboards. He's got Iraqi kids, all these Muslim kids. He's meeting. He's telling them about Jesus. He's teaching them how to skateboard. It's going pretty darn good. If that's not good enough, one day he's skateboarding again in the downtown area, and a police officer stops him and says, what are you doing, kid? He said, I'm skateboarding. He said, tell me about it. He said, well, this is what we do. Do you have any friends that do that? And he said, yeah. He said, is this a good street for skateboarding? And he said, yeah, it's a real good street. He said, okay, we're going to divert the traffic so you guys will have a place to skateboard. I mean, this really happened. This is him, his true identity. He's a skateboarder for Jesus in Iraq. The article was Skate Baghdad. That was the title of it. He won that. Then somebody from Red Bull, one of those energy drinks, shows up, meets him, says, hey, I'm looking for somebody who skateboards to be our poster boy. Would you be willing to do that? And he said, yep. Good Texas answer. And uh, he got that job. So now he's getting to be well known. He starts his own skateboard company. Then they move. The king of Jordan hears about him calls for him to come visit. The king of Jordan says, we want to build a skateboard park. We know you work with Red Bull. Would you kind of help be on the committee that puts it together and gets it designed? This smart kid rents a shop across where they're about to build the skateboard park, opens his business, repairs skateboards, sells skateboards, gives skateboards away, advertises for Red Bull right across the street. It just works. And by the time he goes to college in Boston at 18 years old, he's got a successful business in the Middle East going because he was the skateboarder for Jesus. This is how God works. This kid didn't have a shot in the dark moving to Baghdad, but God opened the door, sent the army tank, opened up the park with all the fountains that became skateboard bowls, built the skateboard park. This is how God works when you step out in faith. Hebrews 11, 1, faith is being sure of things hoped for and certain of things not seen. How do you do that? Quick reminder, think of a four-level pyramid. The thoughts you think again and again and again are the foundation of this pyramid. Next level up, your beliefs. What are your beliefs? It's the thoughts you think again and again and again. That's how you get beliefs. You think something enough, whether it's true or false, you will believe it. You go from your beliefs, you put all your beliefs together, there's your faith. That's why we have the Episcopal faith, the charismatic faith, the Catholic faith, all these different faiths because they have a little bit different sets of beliefs because of what they've thought all their lives. And then the fourth level, Matthew 9, 29, according to your faith, be it unto you. So that's Jesus talking. According to your faith, be it unto you. How do you build that faith? You keep thinking the right stuff. You want to change your experience, change your thoughts. Thoughts are things. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. So if God has told you what your identity is, 
see yourself, imagine yourself, feel yourself being in that place, being that person, and it will eventually come to pass for you. So we've got Gideon here. Gideon has been told his identity. He doesn't buy it. He thinks my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I'm the least in my father's house. I just can't do it. I'm not the man you're looking for. But then he said to this angel, if now I found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring you my present and set it before you. And he said, I will stay till you return. I want to see the, I want you to see the progression. He starts with no faith. You have forsaken us. And then he denies his true identity. He argues about it. And then he has just enough faith to say, maybe if you're real and you prove it to me, I can believe you. So he's trying. God's working with him at every different step of the way. Gideon goes to his house to prepare a young goat, unleavened cakes with an ephah of flour, the meat he put in a basket and the broth he put in a pot and brought them to him under the terebinth and presented them. The angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour broth over them. And he did so. The angel of the Lord reached out the tip of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes and fire sprang from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. I like this next line. Then Gideon perceived, isn't that a good line? Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. Good perception, Gideon. And Gideon said, alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, peace be to you, do not fear, you shall not die. Now, see, we've gone from the visible angel of the Lord who departs, who vanishes. Now he's talking to the unseen God. So his faith is growing, and he builds an altar, and he's, he dedicates it to the Lord. He's, he gives it to him. So Gideon struggles that way, and then God tells him another assignment for him. It's getting rough this time. Ask him to do something hard. Has God ever asked you to do something hard? He has me like love my neighbors, like don't judge, like forgive. Sometimes those internal things that are very intangible are very hard to do. Sometimes we do tangible things. Sometimes we, we have to move to other places. Sometimes we have to go be foreign missionaries. We have to learn new language. We have all kinds of things to do that are a huge challenge. And those things, it's like sometimes we'll change careers. There are all kinds of things that are hard to do. And now God's dropping a zinger on him. I want you to steal your father's prize bull and his second best bull, the one that's seven years old. These are prize steers. These are good bulls. I mean, the best. And I want you to sacrifice them. I want you to tear down the altar that was built in your city to Baal. I want you to tear down the Asherah pole next to it. I want you to use that to build a fire and sacrifice your father's bulls on this. This is Gideon's response. Verse 27. So Gideon took 10 men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. Now, here we have Gideon experiencing fear and acting in faith. That happens often. God keeps raising the bar. And every time the bar is raised, it gets scary again. It's something we've never done before. So we may have fear, but we can overcome that fear with our faith. He did it. He just hedged. It is an interesting character. He hedges God. And next he's going to fleece God. So he says, hey, God, okay. God's, God's about to, to work in his life. Watch what happens after he sacrificed the bulls. 
and the altar of Baal and the Asherah pole. The city comes together. They meet, said, who did this thing last night? They figured out it must have been Gideon. So he goes to his father and says, send Gideon out. We're going to kill him. Joash, his dad, who's just had his son steal his favorite two bulls, responds and comes to his rescue. Then the men of the town said, Joash, bring out your son that he may die, for he's broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, will you contend for Baal or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by mourning. If he is a god, let him contend for himself because his altar has been broken down. Therefore, on that day, Gideon was called Zerubbabel. That is to say, let Baal contend against him because he broke down his altar. Now, that looks like bad trouble. You've ripped your dad off. The whole city is mad at you because you've destroyed their altar to Baal and their Asherah pole. But there's much bigger trouble not far away staring at them. Verse 33, now all the Midianites and the Malachites and the people of the east came together and they crossed the Jordan and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon and he sounded the trumpet and the Abizarites were called out to follow him. Do you see what God has done now? He has given Gideon an anointing. He clothed Gideon in his spirit. I have been around people who've been clothed in the spirit of God, and they're the miracle workers. They're the people that raise the dead. They're the people that they just hold their hand out, and a crowd of people will fall down under the power of God. Like Jesus, when they came to crucify him, 600 men coming up the side of the mountain say, we're looking for Jesus. And he said, King James says, I am he, but in the King James, he is italicized, which means it didn't show up in the original manuscript. Jesus basically said, I am. You remember a God introduced himself to Moses. Who are you? I am that I am. That's the name of God. Jesus said, I am, and all of them fell down backwards, the whole crowd. That's the power of God. When you're clothed, in the spirit of God, you've got the power of God all around you. Gideon blows a trumpet and all of his family, people, the Abizarites, all show up. He sends a messenger to gather other warriors. They all show up. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali, and they went up to meet them. And that's when, after all of this, he's been clothed in the Spirit of God. He's seen all these people, 32,000 people, show up to fight on his side. And then he's ready to fleece God. It's like, oh, my faith has sunk again. Now, the reason we study the Bible is so their story can become our story. I think all of us... We're high in faith and we're low in faith. And we're high in faith and we're low in faith. We cycle. It happens to the best of the best in the Bible. Gideon is the most well-known, remembered forever judge there was. And he started out pretty slow. He, but he gets better every time. This time he says, okay, God, I just got to know. Just do this one more thing for me. We'll be good to go. I'll lead your people. I'll accept the call. I'll be a mighty man of valor. I'm all in if you do this one thing in the morning. I'm going to put a fleece out and just let the fleece be soaking wet with dew and all the ground around it totally and completely dry. If you'll do that supernatural miracle and wonder for me, I will believe you. Gets up the next morning. There's the fleece. It looks wet. He picks it up. He squeezes it. He rings it out, said there was a bowl full of water. That much water came out. It was absolutely, totally saturated. God gave him what he asked for. Wasn't enough. Have you ever told God, I'd be happy if you just do this? And he does it, and then you're not happy? You want more? Get in wanting more. He said, God, let's, let's just, just so I can be sure. I just need to be sure. 
Now, we hadn't written Hebrews 11, 1, where faith is being sure of things hoped for. He's trying to get to that place. He's trying to reassure himself God works with him graciously. This time, let the fleece be dry and the ground wet. So he does that. God does it from the second up. Now he's ready to go. And you think, great, he's going to the battle. He's going to take his 32,000 people. He's going to win it. God said, nah, don't think so. I'm glad you felt good about 32,000 people. It's too many because I know you guys, if you win the battle, you're going to take credit because you had a big army. It's not going to happen. You need to get rid of some people. So Gideon told everybody, 32,000 soldiers, if any of you are afraid, you can leave. Pack up and go now. We'll make it without you. It's all right. Go. If you're afraid, go. Starts with 32,000 people. He tells them that. And it gets bad. 22,000 people leave. Now he's down to just 10,000. That's two-thirds of his army just walked away because God told him to get rid of them. And God said, okay, you've still got too many. We've got to get it down a lot more. Send the people to the river to drink and watch. He got all these people, 10,000 people going down to the river to drink. Most of them get on their hands and knees. They stick their mouth in the water and get a nice drink from the river. Before it's drink from springs and clear streams and like three hundred people, that probably the Midianites, the Malachites, and the people from the east. Uncountable numbers. Much more. You could count thirty-two thousand people. These are uncountable. Much bigger. They're right there. So these other 300 guys drop to one knee, scoop the water with their hands so they're always looking, they're always watching. These are skilled in war. They don't want to be surprised. They want to see if anything's coming. Maybe somebody's waiting just as soon as they all get down to their hands and knees to attack them. Who knows? But they're watching. Keep those. Let the rest go. Now he's got 300 people. That's not enough at all. And God's got this crazy plan that makes even less sense. You know that animals naturally know if they're herd animals, if predators come, stay together. Don't get separated. Stay together. This huge army that's filling the whole valley of Jezreel, when you've got 300 people and you surround them, those 300 people are going to each be alone just because of the sheer distance between them. They can't stand there and talk. They're by themselves. They all go to their positions. Gideon gives them a jar and a torch and a trumpet. And the plan is when I tell you, I want you to break the jar. I want you to wave the torch. I want you to blow the trumpet. I want you to shout for the Lord and for Gideon. And they did exactly what God told them to do. And it worked because the army wakes up in the middle of the night to this loud sound of 300 crashing pottery jars. They look around. They see all the torches. All they know is for every torch, there may be thousands of men standing around them that they can't see. And they think they're being attacked and they start to fight with each other and they kill each other. And Gideon has this huge beautiful victory. I tell you his story because every step of the way, God took him with his small faith, did something for him to grow his faith until he got his faith up to the level. He was willing to go into the darkness with 300 men, separate them all, and follow through on God's plan. God won. And the people of Israel were set free. God wins. His people are blessed. This is how faith works. Tell you one last story. We'll call it quits for the day. Joel Osteen talked about a young lady that he knew. 
probably in Houston. I don't know what her name was, but she grew up in, in government projects in a single mother home. Her mom was usually gone because she's working two or three jobs all the time, just trying to survive. No father in the house. By the time she was 16, she was pregnant. She had a baby. She dropped out of school. And she was just down. I mean, she'd had so many cycles of lack, of defeat, of disappointment, of frustration. But something in her said, there's got to be more for you. You used to have dreams of having a good life. Don't give them up. So after she adjusted to being a mother, she decided to go back to school and she got her GED. She went at night. She got it. And she thought, this is good, but it's not enough. I want a college degree. So she worked during the day, took care of her child, went to college at night. Four years later, she graduates with high honors from college. She thinks this is good, but it's not enough. I want more. She goes back. She gets her master's in education. Along the way, when she had this revelation that God's got more from me, she picked up a job in a school and she was punching tickets. They had meal tickets and she punched their meal tickets so they couldn't use it again and again and again. That was her job. Worked two or three hours a day while they were having lunch. And she worked in the school, and that's when she decided maybe she'd like to be an educator. She got her master's degree today. She works at the same school where she was punching tickets, and she's the vice principal. It takes faith, but with faith, all things are possible. Hebrews 11, 6 reminds us without faith, it's impossible to please God. All those who earnestly seek him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So ask yourself, how can you take a step up in faith? You don't have to go out and fight a gigantic, uncountable army to be faith. You might just be struggling with something. Think if I could take just this tiny little step. If I'd stop thinking this and start thinking that, that might be the step of faith you take. That step of faith may be somebody treated you wrong. It's all their fault. You're totally, completely innocent. You're not guilty of anything. But God says, reach out and love them. That's a big step of faith. He's not going to call you to more than you can handle, but he will call you to more than you're comfortable with. Because with him, you can handle absolutely anything. It's just, are you willing to take that next step of faith? And if you do, you'll be rewarded. So we talked about last week, believing God is his love language. God feels loved when we believe him and when we act upon his word. 